Okay, hi, Miss Sue. Hi. I wanted to ask you, what is your title for and job description for your movement? For Port Hope, Delaware, I'm the co-founder and co-director of Port Hope, Delaware. Kathy Copera and I started the organization about two years ago, and it's a nonprofit that advocates for and is hoping to create some affordable housing in Dover. Okay, so with affordable housing, you're talking about miniature, tiny houses. Talking about tiny houses. Uh, we're discovering there's a need for all kinds of different types of housing. So along with the tiny house villages, we're hoping to help with renovating some houses into micro apartments and different things. But tiny house villages is our main goal, and that's, that's what our movement is mostly about, having individual homes for everybody. Okay, so what do you think are some of the issues with um, and issues and concerns that you think people uh, would have that aren't really for your movement? Well, it's um, nimbyism, not in my backyard. It's, it's very common, it's throughout the country. That's been one of the main things that has been the biggest discrimination against movements like this and other types of affordable housing. Um, people don't want things that they don't understand living near them and so they immediately when they think oh some homeless people are living here or folks that we don't understand it's more of a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding of who these folks are um, discrimination against poor people is really what it basically is okay so what do you think are some things you can do to have people gain knowledge on homelessness probably the biggest thing is what we've been doing for the past two years is trying to get the information out trying to get the public and formed and aware of the fact that we have lots of homeless people, who they are, why they're homeless, what the different situations are, so maybe they can understand better that these are no different than the neighbors around them now. You don't know who you are living around in regular neighborhoods, no different than you might be in a tiny house village. So it's hopefully awareness and understanding from the community to know who these folks are and to maybe then want to help more and be more involved. So on your website, there was, um, there was a Q&A, and we noticed that you said that you would provide social services for, the people, for your tenants and these um, tiny houses. What are some ways you will be able to, pro like, what are some of the ways you, you'll be providing the social services? The, one of the biggest things for, uh, housing is not the only answer. Just putting somebody into a house isn't going to necessarily solve their problem. So wraparound services is a real big important piece to getting anybody comfortable and to permanent housing. So it can be in many different versions. It depends if we have a large enough area and we get a big enough village, there could be offices right on site. Um, if it's housing that's scattered around, then you would just make sure each of these individuals was connected up with their own social worker and if it needed rides, getting back and forth and things that would help support them to stay involved in the, the programs that they might need to get linked up with. There's different levels of support that people need. You have some that just need a little bit, just a little bit of attention and, and somebody to you know, get some guidance from, all the way to folks that need attention pretty much on a daily basis. So it's such an individualized type of thing, and it would really depend on the situation that was set up, whether it's a village or micro apartments, if there can be uh, social workers that could come right on site and possibly visit the group as a whole. So there's a lot of different options, but it's so important if you're going to get folks that are already struggling as, with homelessness into homes, they need to have wraparound services to help them succeed. Okay. And what are some ways you will be able to finance the social services? The financing is always, of course, one of the biggest issues with this. Most of what we're dealing with would be, as far as building and getting the whole project started, has been on voluntary and donation basis. Once things get rolling, there's quite a bit of funding out there, especially for social services. Most of the folks that we work with have mental health issues, a lot of addiction issues and things of that nature. So. There's programs out there that are funded that, that can help keep those uh, programs you know, involved in their lives as well. So some of the funding might not necessarily come directly to us. Funding would be on an individual basis. We would make sure that they were able to get the services and their Medicaid card and their ID so that they can then go link up with the offices that they need to. So it's as much giving them the basis to know how to navigate the system and find the help that's already out there that you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The help is there, we just need to help make sure that they get to it, understand it, and know how to keep that going for them. Okay, so another question and concern people are having is, is this a permanent or temporary living arrangement? 
For, um, again, because it's also individualized, you might have somebody that's uh, coming out of a situation that's younger, 40 or 50s, and his opportunities are going to be different than a gentleman that's maybe in his 70s that is unhealthy, has health issues. So for that older gentleman, this might be his permanent situation. This would be a nice setup. He could get set up into a village situation where the other folks around him, they all help each other. They kind of live almost like a campground deal where they might get together and eat quite often. And one guy's a carpenter and another one's a painter and somebody else is a gardener. So they all you know, work together to maintain. So for them, it could be a permanent situation and this would be a good situation for them. Others, it could be a stepping stone into something better. They just, you know, right now they're into a shelter situation. They need something that is a little more stable so that they can get a little bit better on their feet. And they might then look to owning a home sometime or something. So they could move into something a little bit different. So it really depends on that person's situation and what their needs are. There's a, the uh, senior citizen population of homeless is increasing bigger than any other population. And those folks, you have to look at that a little differently. There is no, everybody says, I need to just get to work and get, get some training and get to work. You're 70 years old and you've been a plumber your whole life. Maybe you didn't set yourself up very good and all you've got is a social security check that's coming in for $700 a month, somewhere in that range. You got nowhere to live, there's nothing for you. So, you know, that's kind of bad. You spent your whole life and you struggled and you've worked really hard, but all that's left is what you've and it's, it's your own fault. You might have should have thought and done better as far as savings, but so many in my generation did not. And so that's what they've got left to live on. So we need to have opportunities for folks that are in their twilight years to be able to live on what's coming in for their income, and there should be options for them as well. And that would be permanent for them. Okay. So your houses are... Your houses are 10 by 20, 200 square feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what is actually inside the home? In the model that we have um, built so far, we have an eight by 20 that we only made it eight feet wide so we can ride on the road without extra permit, so we can take it to parades and so forth. But the final, the, the um, main house that we're looking at is 10 by 20, 200 square feet. The main living area would have a kitchen with a pull-out bed of some sort. It might be a Murphy bed. The one in our model home pulls out from underneath of the kitchen platform. Mm -hmm. Then there's also a bathroom with a shower facility in it. So we, our thoughts are originally for single individuals in these 200 square foot homes. And so they have enough in there for really one single person to live. As we move forward, we hope to maybe double that, to go to a 400 square foot, so then we could have a couple. And then maybe the next step would be enough for a small family, you know, two, two parents and two kids or something, or a single mom. So right now the 200 square foot really is just one large, kind of like a studio apartment, a large main room with a kitchen and a pull-out bed underneath of it, and then a bathroom on the back end of it. And what are the costs for these small homes? They, um, the one that we had built, I think that because they also built it on a, a really nice trailer, uh, the, the trailer that it was built on, is in real industrial kind of thing, and that's because we were going to be hauling it a lot. 25000 was about the cost to put that together. Without the trailer, we're looking at probably about $12,000 to build these. Now, we have lots of opportunities that we'll be looking into as we get closer to the builds for uh, donations of lumber. What we need to do flooring is the scraps at Barack Homes, that sort of thing. So a lot of the things we could get in would be donations. So our costs for final builds might be a whole lot different than that straight out cost. But if you were to go out, buy the lumber and, and build it the, the way that we have, about $12,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on your website, there was something that said that prison industries were notified about your, your um, proposal with this project and they'll be getting back to you with with their decision. What's the update on that? Well, um, about two years ago when we started this project, we had, we really went gung-ho and we got a lot of organizations and we spoke to a lot of uh, people around here as the schools and things. Prison Industries was one of them. Um, and they were very happy to, their thoughts were to possibly build the walls and the different things, components right on site at the prison. And then those that were allowed outside the prison could bring them out and build them on site. Um, we never really have a final decision because we're kind of stuck in limbo with the city and the county and the type of zoning that's going to be required and finding the appropriate site 
is until you have the site and you can't present it to the city or the county to get that particular site approved. So um, as, as we kind of had to back down on a lot of that movement until we got the city and the county and all of us on board and found the appropriate site for it. So I would hope as we got back into that, to that, um, to the building end of it, we would approach them again. But right now that's kind of been set on the back burner. Um, the same as with Polytech. We had talked with Polytech superintendent and that was about two years ago. They are all on board with their students being involved in the electrical wiring and the plumbing and so forth. We've now had, I work at Polytech also, we've now had two superintendents change over. So we'll have to revisit these conversations with each of these organizations as we get a little closer and get into actually doing some active moving. We've done a lot of advocacy and awareness and education for the past two years. And we're looking real close, hopefully, to start some action in building soon, too. Okay. Okay, so also on your website, there was something that said you're looking for business and churches to help you adopt a house. Mm -hmm. um, how many businesses and churches are actually for this movement? Well, similarly to the, your, the other question, we, we had quite a few churches on. Uh, the church we're in here now, People's mm -hmm. Church, was, which is my church, is very interested in hearing more about it. We had a good half dozen churches that were wanting to hear more, inviting us back for more talk. But again, we kind of had to slow that all down. We didn't want to start getting donations in and materials and then have it just sit for a year or two. We realized right. we had some more educating people and work to do in, the, in that way. So we'll be sending out information again to the churches, revisiting those conversations. But what we're looking for is hopefully the churches might want to adopt it, whether they do it um, as you know they might team up. But in that way, they might be able to adopt the cabin. They might be able to design it the way they want, name it the Presbyterian House or the you know, United Church of Christ House, whatever that their congregation is, and maybe even adopt the, the folks that come into it and help make that a mission to help maybe even help the folks that move into that particular house. So we've got a few different ideas that we've approached churches. They, they're very interested because they want to do whatever they can to help the homeless and the, the, those in need around the area. So. We don't necessarily have commitments, but only because we kind of stopped and said, hold on, we, we really need to get our footwork down here and make sure everything's, all our ducks are in a row before we start taking in funds and things like that. Okay. So now, what's your next step moving towards building these tiny homes? Well, things luckily have been moving, I think, very well. The mayor's task force has put their heads together and has had some uh, I think some real good uh, reaction from some community members that own properties that have offered to give up some of these properties. We're hearing numbers like 200 beds worth of homes available that could be um, a, maybe an apartment building here, two or three houses over there, uh, different things like that. But they say it amounts to about 200 beds worth of homes. Part of that is land and tiny house villages are a component in the task force plan. So we're looking like you know, little, little baby steps along the way, but there looks like to be some properties that are gonna become available that um, can be renovated into housing, and then through that also some land that will become available, and that's where we step in. Port Hope, Delaware has also branched a little bit out into Port Hope construction. We have a handful of homeless guys that are in the construction trade and general contractors that work with us. So as these properties become available, we're going to step in and try to have a little bit of our hands into that and that's how we'll begin our fundraising for our tiny houses. So every bit of funds that come in through our renovation and remodeling work to help with these 200 beds will go towards building and putting money towards our tiny house villages. So we see it's, it's, it's movement that's kind of a lot behind the scenes but uh, in, throughout the nation it takes about five years from the time somebody decides we're going to do this to when they start seeing houses being you know, having people in them. So we're two years in. I think we're doing pretty good. We're, I think another year from now, we're going to start seeing some land being identified, approved by the county, and houses built. So that's my goal. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sue. You're welcome. Thank you for coming in and talking to me. Anytime.